share the screen. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 3. Um, I want to let you know that we're being recorded. So if you don't want to be seen, you can turn your, turn your video off. Um, if you are not a committee member, we ask that you um, sign in by entering your name and affiliation and any, any, any item you wish to speak to in the chat box. Um, as we go through this, this, uh, this is not in the list, but as we go through it, if you want to raise your hand to speak, you can do so. So you don't have to put speaking in the chat box right now, but if you know, you can. Uh, let's see, here somebody else wants in. Okay, I guess the main thing is to know how to mute and unmute yourself. So you are, you're coming into this meeting muted, but you can unmute, unmute to speak, but you should only do that if you raise your hand and I recognize you. Um, and this is how you do it. You've got a mute icon at the bottom of your screen. And, you, and if you're on a desktop computer, you can use your space bar to mute and unmute yourself. The other thing is raising hand. That seems to be confusing to some people. So if you're on a desktop, click participants at the bottom of your screen. And at the bottom of that list, you'll see a button labeled raised hand. On a phone, press star nine. Okay. And the rest is not, we don't have to go through right now. So let me come back here. Um, we are lacking one of our members, I believe. Oh no, Carol is here. Carolyn's there. Yes, okay, so everybody's here. Um, so let me put up the agenda. Go back to sharing screen again. Here, we'll see if I can do this. This is so much fun. Here we go. Okay, here's the agenda. I, I altered the order of things a little bit um, between the Mulberry Street discussion and the district needs discussion, since I suspect most of our attendees are here to talk about Mulberry Street. So I think we'll, we'll deal with that first and then district needs is more of a committee discussion, although everyone is welcome to stay for it. And so the first thing on our list is to approve the previous month's minutes. Um, let me go back to... Oh, I guess, um, let's see, Carolyn, are you unmuted? Go ahead and unmute yourself. And just uh, all in favor of approving the last month's minutes, please say aye. 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 Thank you. I'm also not yes. voting because I wasn't there. <laughs> you're absent, you're, you're, you're nodded. Yeah, you're, you're. Uh, yeah, I wasn't there, but I read the minutes. So um, oh. I allowed well, The two of you I have to. <laughs> have to. I have to abstain. You're, you're both abstaining. That's fine. Okay. So we got two, well, two in favor and abstain. All right. So our next issue is 70 Mulberry Street. Um, I'd like members of the committee who have something to say about 70 Mulberry Street to speak first. Uh, this is basically a community discussion. Anyone who wants to speak can do so. Um, but we'll do committee first and then everyone else. Mitchell, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, um, 70 Mulberry Street was um, built in 1893 as the first public school building designed by the superintendent of schools, C.B.J. Snyder. And it was the first of the 170 school buildings um, under his uh, command. Uh, and it started off the innovations in school design that were repeated, not only in this city, but throughout the country. It's architecturally important for several reasons, including the fact that he was able to provide light and air through uh, paired windows to the classrooms. It was a masonry building, which before that, before this time, was somewhat unusual. There, there were smaller school buildings, mostly, uh, or in many cases, of wood. Uh, in addition to that, and ironically, 
at least part of the building was fireproof construction. And um, it remains in the very heart of the historic core of Chinatown and embodies both the individual and collective histories of generations of uh, neighborhood uh, residents who attended that school or attended the cultural programs in that school. Yes, there was a serious fire that destroyed the upper stories of the building, of the five-story building. Uh, but I contend that without community input, the city just behind the scenes, without transparency, made a decision to spend $6 million to destroy this historic building and, and um, it's going to be an irreparable loss to the Chinatown community. And uh, we need to hold the city to a higher standard. The five tenants in the building could have had a rehabilitated building maintaining the architectural features of the exterior of the building if it was a more uh, deliberate and transparent procedure. Excellent introduction. Um, are there members of the committee, do you have anything to say about this? I think it's really awful what's happening that, uh, you know, I understand that the city, the demolition team caught the steel uh, girders that were supporting the building uh, as fast as they could um, after the community board resolution. Um, and it smacks of that they want to demolish the building as fast as they can. They really don't care that people want to preserve the building or that it has a particular importance. I think there's a lack of transparency um, that just reeks of um, something not very good. And it's odd that my understanding is, even though I was not present at the land use committee meeting, that there were at least two of the tenants who originally wanted the building restored and then two days later had totally switched that they felt that the only way that they could get their space back was if the building was totally demolished. And I don't think that that is a very accurate uh, description of what restoration is about, that it necessarily takes longer than uh, new construction. And I think it needs to be looked at as to what strings were pulled and how this could happen. Thank you. So um, I'd like to say something. Um, um, I mimic uh, Mitchell and both Carolyn's remarks. Um, I think it was great historical loss. Um, however, there was a letter submitted later at the CP3 meeting from the LPC. I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something like, um, even before the fire, the building did not rise to the level of uh, his landmarking, right? Um, I, I just wish we could do something to identify buildings that uh, should be landmarked now, right, in order to preserve them. Because uh, this building, like Mitchell said, was the first. So it should have, and there have been others that have been landmarked already. Why was this one overlooked, you know, completely? And um, I just feel it's really a shame, it's a travesty. Had it been identified earlier, it could have been landmarked and preserved the way it should have been. Um, but uh, if the landmarks, like we know, we are only advisory and the Landmark Preservation Commission, was, if they say that you know, it doesn't rise to the level, then it, it just doesn't, even before the fire, 
uh, the last uh, 10 or 20 years before the fire. I, I don't know the time period exactly, but that's what the letter stated, right? That's correct. They had declined. Okay. They had declined to evaluate it for landmarking before the fire. Um, okay. And that, that does not rise to the level is uh, boilerplate landmarks commission talk. So when they don't want to go further. And it's true, right. there are some modifications to the building, but I, I don't believe they were significant enough. They, they should have designated it when it was intact. Too late for that right. now. Exactly. Um, now, just to make sure everybody knows, af at the last land use committee meeting, we, the, a resolution was passed and the resolution asked that an independent uh, preservation oriented engineer be employed to evaluate, separately evaluate the building because we didn't feel that their uh, structural engineer had any particular background in preservation. Um, and that has, is underway. And a town hall meeting is going to happen on the 25th, Wednesday the 25th. Um, there should be notices about that coming out. And at that meeting, they will report on the results of their evaluation. And we'll see what happens. So if you would like to speak about this, oh, audience, feel free to raise your hand. Edgar? Yes. Uh Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity uh, in regards to speaking. My name is Edgar Prey. I'm from the Chinese American Planning Council. I'm one of the uh, tenants who actually occupied the uh, building at 70 Mosbury Street. We've been there for over 40 years operating a uh, senior center that serves roughly about 300 to 400 seniors per day, um, providing opportunity for seniors to come in to get a warm meal, socialization, and uh, various uh, activities such as dance, calligraphy, art, and, and music. Like other tenants, it is important for us to return as soon as possible, being mindful of the independent enge engineering report currently being conducted. I just want to give you a quick overview of why it's vitally important for Chinatown Senior Center to move back in as soon as possible. As you know already, before COVID-19 took a, a, a grasp across New York City, it was already became difficult for our seniors not having an existing location for programming, being the fact that we serve 300 to 400 seniors. The local senior centers were very graciously enough to actually allow us to occupy, uh, send some of our seniors over to occupy their space, but they do not have the capacity to actually serve 300 to 400 seniors a day, let alone their seniors already there being in service. Um, having to walk further than, uh, further than they were, they're very accustomed to, it, it's become a very, a, a problem for our seniors. So the fact that our seniors are, are are, are, are people of habit that we got very comfortable and had routines already walking to a new senior center. Identifying a new place for them would be some type of a transition to get used to. Um, while DCAS and DIFTA and the city of New York have been very supportive, we had to look very hard for a new space. And again, because of everything going on regarding COVID-19, that put a wrench in, our, in our, our whole thing that's been going on. Not only do we have to make sure that we find a, a, a sustainable place for our seniors temporarily, we have to negotiate with the landlords and modify our budgets with DIFTA in regards to actually how do we going to be paying for this, let alone the morale. Uh, I can honestly tell you, and if Council, Council Member Chin was on the call, she can testify to the fact that I've, she's had several seniors reach out to her asking that please help have this done sooner or later. Our seniors are being become very sad, let alone when the fire occurred. They're falling to levels of depression and sadness because they, they feel that their senior center will never return. And that's something I, I, I carry a heavy heart that I don't want to say that will happen. That's why I'm making sure the best I can that we can provide them a place to go. The most important thing that we're very fearful of the fact that if this takes any longer than necessary, is the possibility of us being defunded if we weren't able to move back. If we don't have a location to run a senior center, <clears throat> we, we fund fears of the fact that we're going to be defunded and, and that's going to be a travesty not, not a, let alone not having a place for the seniors, but having 300 or 400 seniors to find a new, new place to go, it, it's, it's difficult as it is during these times as now. 
all we're asking for, and again, understanding everyone's concerns and viewpoints, but the full demolition of 70 Mulberry must continue without delay as we are anxious to return his home <laughs> as soon as possible. Throughout the full de demolition process, priorities should be placed on preserving elements of the lobby, the facade, the historic signage, and the cast iron columns with the goal of memorizing, memorizing the history of 70 Mulberry in the new building. Engaging the 70 Mulberry tenants is very important to really get our, our viewpoints and ideas of how this building should look like moving to the future. Um, overall, it's important for our seniors. It's important for them to actually have a new place to return back to. Any delay, it's just gonna make things a lot more difficult morale-wise and overall difficult at all for them to actually enjoy what they used to call home. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to stipulate something. Um, whether Whichever way this goes, whether the building is preserved or a new building is put in place, I think everyone wants it to be done as quickly as possible. Everyone is just torn up about the fact that you've lost your space. We all support the city getting busy and finding you good temporary space because whatever happens, you're going to be, you know, it's going to be quite a while before there's a new space for you. Correct. So, um, I, you know, they, I don't think there's a soul in this community board that would, would want a delay. And that's part of what we're going to learn from the engineer, um, this, this later this month. Very good. Thank you. Right. Uh, right. Uh, Richard Moses. Uh, thanks, Linda. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to say I agree very strongly with, uh, with Mitchell and Carolyn and, uh, Ms. Druther, uh, had said earlier. Um, in terms of landmarking of the building, it would have been great to have the building landmarked. In our experience, uh, the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative's experience, it can be a real wide variety of reasons that landmarks does not want to landmark a building. Anything from alterations to political considerations to um, feeling that the priorities are elsewhere, they don't have the staff. So. Um, you know, we feel that the building is certainly landmark quality and that it is a contributing building to the Chinatown in Little Italy uh, National Register Historic Building uh, District, so that the state and federal government has already recognized the historic and architectural importance of the building. And that's one of the reasons it's, it's so shocking uh, to us that it's, it's being taken down like this um, without consideration. Uh, speaking to uh, getting um, all of the tenants back as quickly as possible, as Linda said, uh, we're all 100% for that. But we feel it, and my experience is not only with the Lower East Side of Preservation Initiative, but as, as an, a preservation architect with over 25 years experience, that in, in my experience, uh, restoring and, and reconstructing a building such as this is much faster than taking it down to the ground and planning a new building from scratch. Uh, that isn't to say that the interior shouldn't be modernized and the building retrofitted to meet code, but um, I don't see any reason why this, this would be um, a tricky situation here. Uh, we do not believe that uh, salvaging some elements from the building and, and putting them in the lobby or uh, building a new building on, on, on the base is a suitable substitution for uh, reconstruction and restoration. Um, as, as Kerry Colhane has uh, pointed out before, Higgins Hall at Pratt Institute uh, had just as serious a fire as this, may perhaps more serious. It's a building of a similar vintage, a little bit older than this building, um, and it was reconstructed quickly, and, and the architecture school went back in uh, very quickly and the building to this day looks, looks beautiful and is loved by the school. And this is what we'd like to see uh, happen to the historic core of Chinatown. Um, Chinatown, we feel, is one of the most historically important um, communities and, and neighborhoods in the city, if not the country, and that it deserves the kind of respect marking the history of, of Chinese immigration into this country as well as immigration of other groups. Um, it's something that needs to be uh, respected and memorialized. And taking down one of the most historically important buildings 
in the community, which is also one of the most prominent locations right across from, from Columbus Park, would be a real loss, a real tragic loss for Chinatown at a particularly difficult time for the community. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands. Would someone else like to speak? Uh, Tommy Loeb? Yeah, I, I appreciated that, that comment, but I also wanted to add one other building in the community. Those of you who've lived on the Lower East Side long enough, remember St. Ox in the Bowery Church had a devastating fire, which almost destroyed the entire building, but we didn't level it and uh, put a grassy plane there or a new building, uh, we restored the building. So restoration is not something we should, something new or we should eliminate just because there was a fire. Um, can I ask you where that building is? St. Mark's Church is on- uh, Oh, St. Mark's. A Street, yeah. yeah. You. Yes, Street. indeed. Yeah, that was an excellent restoration. Yes, and it, it had a horrendous fire, which the, so people could have chosen at that time to just tear it down, but it was felt that it was an important enough building to restore. And I guess to be uh, transparent and fair, that's the landmark building, which unfortunately our school is not. Um, Fanny? Yeah, hi. Um, I just want to ask you about the, the analysis of the ground floor. I, I might have missed it. You mentioned it in the beginning. I might have missed it. Um, what is going on with that analysis? And I want to know, why are they doing the analysis just on the one floor? I mean, if they're going to do an analysis, why can't they do an analysis on the entire building? Because the building has gone. I, I think they are supposed to analyze the whole building. Oh, they are okay. Because I, I thought so. I thought they were going to demolish the entire building, and except for the ground floor, and then do an analysis on the ground floor whether if it's even if that's even salvageable. That was my understanding. Yeah. Well, the analysis is ongoing right now, and so you know during while they're also working on demolishing up above them, which is kind of interesting. Oh, okay, so they're doing it at the same time, okay. Yeah, I mean, there was a strong feeling in the community that we, in the land use committee, agreed with, that they didn't want to want to stop everything. They wanted to be able to proceed, so, you know. Okay, well, we, I mean, we, like, I, I don't speak for the Chinatown community, but I, I did speak with a few of the residents there, residents there, like, the other day, and a lot of them feel that, you know, it's, they feel like the, there's no hope in saving this building. You know, a lot of people feel like that because, at, because of the very fact they are continuing with the demolishing, you know, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's already a sentiment that's around the neighborhood. Um, the other thing is, um, what about, um, suggesting to the city about adding additional floors instead of again in, instead of demolishing it and rebuilding it and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's also that and um and i want to refute um i want to respond to edgar's comment you know um my mother is one of those seniors that used to go to the center there and have lunch every day and yeah, she was really disappointed by the fire and everything because she enjoyed going there and they happened to serve like, she tells me, she told me that one of the best meals in the senior center is around. But, but you have to understand that there are plenty of other senior centers that seniors can go to in that area. I mean, there's also the one on, on Grand Street that she goes to now. So I, I don't think that you know, that should be a hindrance on saving this building because of these seniors have nowhere to go because they do have somewhere to go. So, and, um, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Danny, do you live in Chinatown? 
No, I live in the Lower East Side, but I grew up in the Lower East Side, Chinatown. Okay. It's adjacent. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Wow. Okay. That's all. That's all. Oops, you have the hand right away. Amy Chen. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, I was just concerned about the lack of transparency in the process. Um, I've, uh, I'm concerned that um, there is this idea out there that uh, DCAS has been promoting that it is faster and uh, easier to demolish this building and build new than to preserve it and to retrofit the interior. I mean, to me, that hasn't been proven. And I've um, you know, spoken to many uh, experienced architects and to, some, and to the former assistant commissioner of capital projects um, for the Department of Cultural Affairs and they have told me that actually the opposite is often true, that um, preserving and retrofitting um, or rehabbing um, an old building uh, is, is oftentimes um, faster and cheaper than to tear something down in, entirely and then build new. So um, I know there's a lot of expertise um, here in the committee and if you, know, you could speak to, to that, um, and um, I think that I, I will say that everybody wants the tenants to be back in, in suitable spaces as soon as possible, I mean, as a community. But this building really is a treasure and a touchstone for not just Chinatown, but for the city as a whole. And I think it's just a horrible shame that um, I feel out of expediency, DCAS has um, pushed forward with total demolition without fully exploring um, all of the, um, the possibilities and bringing in the expertise that is out there to, um, to save that for our community. Yep. Thank you. Others would like to speak? Uh, yes. Sorry. What? Uh, you should raise your hand. I'm not sure. Is this Michael who wants to yes. speak? Hey, Michael, go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking out loud about um, 70 Mulberry Street, whether or not it would be uh, prudent to demo the entire building from scratch and redoing the foundation. Because I'm not sure the, China, uh, the uh, Lower East Side China, uh, Chinatown community understands that to rebuild a structure in Manhattan, uh, in this day and age, requires steel piling. Uh, I have pretty much a contractor, whoever is awarded the job, and let's say if they to choose demolition, they're going to have to uh, drive 10, 100 foot steel into the ground. And that's going to be very disruptive to the neighborhood where you're going to have uh, vibrational damages uh, around the adjacent neighborhood. And if, uh, if landmarks or even the building department, they don't really care if the neighborhood shakes when you rebuild this building. So is there any investigation on structural or vibrational studies uh, to look into this, uh, into this matter? Or we're gonna have uh, in six months of construction, half of the, uh, the businesses and half of the homes over there now are like thinking, oh my God, it's a, fi uh, it's a Richter scale 5.0 uh, earthquake that's happening in that area. Is this something that the structural engineer who is doing the independent study is actually looking into this? Well, one thing is we do not know who that is or what firm he represents. So we don't know what he's doing. We won't know till the town hall. Um, but you're, it's a good point, Michael, and it's a, it's a point with any new construction. Usually you get some you know, some damage to the other buildings that are nearby. And I'm not sure that that wouldn't happen with reconstruction of the landmark either. So to be a little careful. Uh, Michael, can you tell yeah, me? Yeah, because I can give you, 
I can give you experience on the construction site that we were um, on a school that uh, was affected by steel vibrational uh, piling, and we're dealing with a two a quarter million dollar insurance claim right now with the contractor next door. The piling is apparently from the neighboring contractor for uh, a job that I worked for. Uh, ended up uh, rupturing underground steam and um, uh, utility pipes. I had an electrical explosion, and that le the insurance claim for that is like over now four to five million dollars, and that's just in downtown Brooklyn. Who knows what kind of utilities and did any site survey happen in an uh, historic building just like 70 Mulberry Street? So demo, haphazardly demoing the building and doing steel pilings on existing infrastructure. I'm pretty sure there's Con Ed Electric and Con Ed Steel that's below there, uh, steam lines are below there, that if these contractors hit the, the, the line, you're going to have catastrophic of power and, and steam leaks that are going in there, potentially water damage too from it. If there's the underground uh, water lines or underground sewer lines that haven't been surveyed. So it's something that I recommend like the entire design team on that job to really investigate before we even talk about demolition or restoration. We have to really study the site better before I recommend restoration. You don't have these problems when you do rec uh, restoration. Thank you. Do you live in Chinatown, Michael? Um, no, I have a, a family and friends who work in business, and I remember that this came up as a town meeting. So I told mm -hmm. them that I would come to the town meeting uh, in, this, uh, in the community board landmarks uh, meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carrie. Carrie Kane. Where are you, Carrie? Can you unmute yourself, Carrie? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Great. Sorry, just out here in the outer net. Um, <laughs> my name is Carrie Colhane, and I am an architectural historian and the author of the Chinatown in Little Italy National Register nomination. And I've said it before, and I'm reiterating that Chinatown today has no landmarks that are reflective of the Chinese American experience, which is a great omission on the part of the city and the city landmarks uh, preservation commission shouldn't be considered the last word on what's important to a community because they do have their own political agenda and requirements so um, this building is a landmark to the community it's clear that even people who have called for full demolition are talking about how important architectural elements are from this building and the best way to preserve the, those elements is to preserve them in place in the building and thinking about the lengthy reconstruction project, whether it's preservation or new construction, preservation could potentially cut time off of that, but this will be coming at the same time that the city is contemplating building uh, the mega jail in the neighborhood. So you'll have two large construction projects going on. And in my experience as someone who consults on restoration projects, um, starting with an already partially constructed building, which is 70 Mulberry, would be much faster and cause much less disruption than an entirely new construction. And I fully support the tenants and their concerns about an expedient return to their businesses and their services. Uh, but let's not confuse expediency that DCAS wants with um, a process that actually returns these tenants to building that uh, is important to the community, reflects the community, supports the community, and provides services to the community. Uh, so don't anyone confuse the uh, DCAS's concern that the preservationists were, you know, going to delay this process because that's just a false narrative that um, helps DCAS cover up the fact that they're just trying to be expedient. Okay, thank you. Any other, uh, anyone else care to speak? No? I have a question, Linda, if it's possible. Sure. Okay, 
has anybody looked to see um, the groundwater in that area? Because the, um, let's see, the, that area is very near Collect Pond, which was 60 feet deep, which the center of it is fully square. The tea house pump was it up the hill from there. The other thing that I can say from experience of living a block away from St. Bridget, when they built Eastville Gardens and they were driving the piles, it cracked the church and the back wall nearly fell off. Uh, there's an underground stream that comes out of Tompkins Square Park that runs out that corner of 8th Street and Avenue B and comes down between 8th and 9th Street. Um, it's like you really, when you're getting into new construction, Michael is right. It requires pile driving and it has to go a certain depth. And I would suggest strongly that everyone look at the Veeley map and see where the glaciers drug, dug out a trough in lower Manhattan. And in my neighborhood, the bedrock is between 150 to 170 feet deep. How, what is the bedrock like in the area there? And now, where are the streams I have this that thought intersect that maybe, in that area? Maybe you would do this job because you, you know how to look at these maps? Yeah, sure. Would you? But I wonderful. think other people should look at it too, particularly the people that own businesses there and that live there. And they should look and read about Collect Pond or Collect Pond. Yeah, the depth yeah, of the pond uh, and the water systems that fed into it. Right. Um, no, I, that's that's an interesting and and what had to happen with other newer buildings that have been built in that area. Right. I know because like one of the things they say is they can float a building on a cement pad. Um, mm -hmm. When they rebuilt Trinity Church, they had to. The architect told the church is that if you try to drive piles, the building next door is going to be in your front yard. Okay, so uh, they suggested that they float a cement pad and that is what the building is floating on. But it had an impact on the parish house that was next door that had to be restored and repaired because it cracked. Um, it had an impact on other buildings on the block. Um, so I think that's something that everyone who lives in Chinatown that is an adjacent to that building, that for your own self-preservation, I would certainly try to make myself aware of what the soil conditions are, the water, the, uh, the type of soils that you have there, and the impact that driving pilings for new construction will have on the, new, uh, the adjacent buildings and the surrounding community. Can you because give us a little intro in how to do that kind of research? Uh, basically, you can Google the Edgar Veeley. Um, How do you spell Veeley? Hospital. V I E L E. Oh, Veeley. Yeah. yeah. His name was Edgar Veeley. He was a sanitation engineer. He was concerned about the way that Manhattan was developing. He did the first map in 1864. That map is still used by construction. Um, it's found generally to be accurate, with, like within a foot in regards to the water. And I really do think that everyone who lives there should really look at that map. Because the other thing is, is you should also ask to see what the soil samples are for that area. Because the consistency of the soil, like where I live, what's sitting on top is like mud, rubble, uh, there's a four, uh, 40 feet below ground, there's a thin sheet of shale that's supporting the, the buildings that are here. The way the buildings that are there now were built, those basements were dug out by hand. They didn't use mm -hmm. like earth movers and backhoes to come in and excavate. Now when you put up a building, not only do you have the pilings, you also have the large machinery that comes with it to excavate and you have to have an elevator. The elevator kit has to go down. When they built the building next to Chata Cell Bohio, my entire building was going, boing. I was sitting at the table. The table was moving. Yeah. Um, so it's like something that everybody should be aware of, particularly if you're in an area that was, has a lot of water and the water did not go away. It, it doesn't vanish. Oh, it was turned uh, into sewers but uh, I it's still there. I hope you'll uh, join us at 
the town hall and uh, make this point because it's a really good point. I will. Anyone else care to speak? All right, well, we've, we've generated some ideas. We've got some facts out. Um, I hope everyone is planning to go to the town hall. Um, let me see if I can, it's a Zoom, it's a Zoom town hall. Now, where will the information be that you need? That's the question. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, share screen. Uh, um, here it is. Okay. June 25th, 6.30 to 8. And do we see the link? Yeah, you, here's the link. I think this link, I would expect this link to be on the community board website. Uh, and I'll make sure that it is because you can't just write all that down. Um, it'll be readily available. And there are posters out that, count, that are in both Spanish and uh, Chinese. So you can also be looking for those. All right, seeing no further hands, I will close this issue for now and we'll move on to the next issue on the agenda, which is the district needs statement. That's my share, my share went away. Share went away. Needs, where are you? There it is. Have a trouble with this. I thought I studied up on this enough to uh, to get it, but who knows? Can anybody see that? Not at the moment. You had Not it at the moment. That? Oh. I can't see it properly. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Hopefully we can see this because I would like to be able to modify this as we go. Uh. <laughs> oh, why me? Why me? There we go. Okay, we have it. Do I? Oh, good. Not that one. Here it is. Okay. So the district needs are, um, it's a statement we make to the agency, in this case, the Landmarks Preservation Commission, uh, each year. And we tell them what it is that we think the, the needs are of this particular district, that is Community District 3. Uh, so there's a little introduction that says why we're doing this. And we ask the LPC to expedite designation of historic districts and individual landmarks in our community. And as we were just talking about, we don't have much in Chinatown and perhaps people will have some suggestions regarding Chinatown. Um, I see what I've done to myself. No wonder I have too many people open, right? <laughs> okay, so um, this is our list of potential historic districts in CD3. Um, the Lower East Side Historic District, which is something that Lesbie and the Friends of the Lower East Side have had in the works for quite a long time, um, working with the Landmarks Commission, uh, working with Council Member Chin, and it's, it's in process, but it's in process for a long time and we like it to be expedited. Um, 
thing is the extension of the East Village Lower East Side Historic District and the extension of the East 10th Street Historic Districts. So those are things, again, they've been, they've been on this list for a few years now. There's nothing new to say about them. Uh, Chinatown Historic District is new and something we'd like the Landmarks Commission to look into. And we'd like the, those of you who are in the Chinatown community to think about whether that's something you want, um, whether that would be a helpful thing or not. Um, Steeple Row is a little row of uh, buildings along East Broadway that are buildings around 1830, modified um, a little bit later into, you know, you typically they had another story added onto them. Um, and it is a place where the small synagogues, the little, little storefront synagogues existed. And there are a few left, but most of them are gone. The Al Smith Historic District, which runs along Oliver Street um, from James, St. James Place to Madison and from James Street to Catherine. A uh, very interesting area. Call it Al Smith because that's where Al Smith was born and where he lived most of his life. Uh, the Bowery Historic District. And finally, the one we've added on this year, <laughs> the area south of 14th Street included in the Union Square South Hotel special permit application. I know some of you have been involved with this and will probably have something to say about it. Um, this area, is, is, it spans Community Board 3 and Community Board 2. Both community boards passed resolutions objecting to the zoning and asking for landmarks designation. I think I'll stop there and I'll go to the individual ones later. So if I have any comments regarding historic districts, uh, let me know. Not really, just to say that they've been on the list for a really long time. I mean, is yes. there anything that we can do to, to kind of get LPC looking at this um, to address it, to, to, to at least speak on it. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, we, we do our best. <laughs> this is yeah, we, the community has to advocate for, and we as right. the Landmarks Committee can, uh, you know, support. Um, let's see, Sarah, you're here, and I know Harry's here too, Harry Bubbins. Do you want to say anything about the 14th, south of 14th Street area? I'm happy to. Um, we, Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, we've been pushing for this for a while. Um, and in the meantime, we have been discovering new things about the area, including um, themes, uh, significant themes of workers' rights, suffragette rights, um, uh, music industry history. Um, Harry Chiman, if you can think of other themes that I'm missing, but really incredible histories there with themes that sort of, you know, um, uh, dot on through the whole area uh, that would attract these different either social movements or industries. And um, we've been sending those to LPC and we've also been getting a lot of support from people who are still involved in those movements um, and writing in letters and asking the LPC to support this um, designation. Um, so this is something that we've been working very, very actively towards, and we truly appreciate your support for the part that, that falls in CB3, although no doubt you support the part that falls in CB2, too. But um, We though, do, uh, and we should be a coalition in this case. Exactly, exactly. Well, community boards are allowed to be coalitions, but... Um, we've published all of the findings that we've found um, on our website, all of our letters, all of our letters of support, from these individuals and from these organizations, including the International Workers Organization, things like that. And um, it, it's so dense in cultural history, not to mention the obvious architectural history as you walk through, and it's so threatened um, that it just seems like a no brainer to us. Um, so we appreciate your support in it. Thank you. Harry, anything else? 
you, Scott. Sure. I, I, since, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity and for the great discussion uh, from Mulberry Street and everything else and uh, pointing out the importance of um, uh, the diversity of history that the LPC should be considering and prioritizing. And since uh, Linda pointed out the, the importance of coalitions across community board lines, I would point out uh, the NAACP is also supportive of the effort to That's achieve right. some landmarking south of uh, Union Square. It's some uh, building their former headquarters in CB2, but it just goes to show that the, the whole, you know, the community board lines are sometimes not as uh, precise as our neighborhood lines are and what we see as our community, but I just wanted to throw that in there uh, as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Harry. Anybody else care to comment on this historic district or any of the others or add some new ones? Any comments? Okay. I can't see raised hands, so if you, you just speak up if you uh, wanna, wanna say something. Yeah, I can either share the document or see raised hands apparently. Although I, I may have something more to learn here. Okay, so we're moving on to individual landmarks and Again, we're going to see that, well, we have a little bit, a couple things on Mott Street, so that's good. We have a little bit of Chinatown in here. I mean, Chinatown is a full contributing part of Community Board 3, and we are very interested in supporting anyone who is interested in preservation in Chinatown. Um, so we have, again, we have some things, three things that have been on this list forever. The James R. Whiting House at 22 East Broadway. That's one of the ones that came up when the Landmarks Commission decided to look at all the, the ancient things that were still on their books and decide whether to keep them or not. And they decided not to keep this one, but we still advocate for it. Uh, the 206 Bowery House, uh, Mitchell, I don't know if you could say something about that. Uh, it was built in the early 19th century and was part of the first developments on the Bowery and it um, was part of the history of the Bowery being a center of the um, cattle and butchering trades. And is one of the few remaining federal style houses on the Bowery. Okay, okay and we have Congregation Chasam Sofer and I have to admit that I haven't been over to look at that to see what's happening with it in recent times. I wonder if anyone else has. I think it's all right. Um, we have the Eastern Three at 75 Essex Street, which Lesby and Friends of the Lower East Side have proposed again to the Landmarks Commission. They turned it down once and we are going around again. Uh, I don't know, Richard, do you get any update on that? Uh, no, except for just the last that we heard that they're considering it this time because of they're still considering all the new construction, uh, you know, at least there's a, a little bit of a glimmer. <laughs> okay. And now we have some new entries and I think we have Deborah Y on here and I think Deborah knows about some of this. So we'll uh, let her speak if she wishes. Um, 311 East Broadway, corner of Grand, um, 197 East Broadway, which is the Educational Alliance, and 371, 379 Madison Street, which is a CBJ Schneider school that's been converted into apartments. Um, so, uh, Deborah, do you want to say anything about these? Not. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, and then we have a couple on Mott Street, 83 Mott Street, corner of Canal, and 60 Mott Street between Canal and Bayard. But uh, wouldn't these fall in a Chinatown historic district? Should we get one? Well, they might, but I think it might be, um, I think one reason I actually had some input from Richard on this, uh, that we added these to the list was that it may be that we have to go for some individual de designations that doesn't preclude a district designation. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be, might be possible to get somewhere. And Chinatown has nothing. I want to uh, include all two. Sorry, uh, 
Richard? Yeah. What's that, Linda? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you go ahead if you want. Oh, no, that wasn't me speaking. Oh, it wasn't. Okay. It, the, the, the thing came to you. Was it Michael? Uh, speaking? Yeah, I have something okay. to add about 60 Mott Street. And this is similar to what happened over at 81 Bowery Street. It used to be a Chinese theater. And for some reason, it never got landmark status. So when the theater got abandoned on 81 uh, Bowery Street, it became a hotel. I think Wyndham Hotel is over there at the corner of Hester yeah. and Bowery Street. And this shows that the city is not interested in maintaining uh, Chinatown landmarks. And I feel that the, 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 uh, the Chinatown is slowly becoming more gentrified where certain historic landmarks are disappearing. And I knew that that theater should have been landmarked as it wasn't. And obviously some developer got some nice deals you know, a high rise um a uh, hotel room and it'd be noticing that um bowery between canal and bayard street and 60 mott street is very important because it's still currently being used as a chinese uh chinese school similar to what you have over at uh, at, uh 70 mulberry street they're both schools uh they both have landmark um um characteristics in there they have theoret uh, theoretical stuff i went to school with it so I know that that building inside out. It's oh, uh, the top great. floors are used as school. Second floor is used by Chinese um, uh, Chinese Community Center uh, program. I think they're now down on uh, Mott Street, and the basement is uh, as a public assembly space to use for theatrical spaces. If you eliminate that, and that becomes another high-rise building, where where does students go study? Where is there another theater? Where do you lost uh, 70 Mulberry Street from the fire? And this is one of the few last public assembly spaces that are available in the community. So I'm really surprised and very disappointed that Landmarks hasn't appointed that as a landmark building. Uh, I just checked the department building's website and still not a landmark building. And you're all right. Yeah, it's still not designated as a landmark building. These are proposals for landmarking. So this, we will tell the Landmarks Preservation Commission that we are interested in having these buildings landmarked. And I have a question. This is Troy. Yeah, I see your hand, Troy. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, how do we get a building added to this list? Tell me about it. Uh, the Baruch <laughs> bathhouse. Ah, yes. It's slated to be done over soon. Um, but I grew up in Baruch, uh, been there 53 years. And this building's been there since 1901. Um, it's part of the community. It should be landmarked as being part of the community and giving back to the community uh, to have yeah. similar things that Chinatown wants for that building on Mott Street that just burned down. Yes, and this is another building that I haven't seen a proposal. For re something's going to happen with it. There has not been a proposal to restore it. Um, and I'm pretty sure LPC has looked at it and declined to landmark it. Uh, something we can follow up on, though. Um, okay, can well, we follow up? Proposals, well, there was a uh, there was a commission uh, a committee a subcommittee a task force excuse me a task force right. uh, for it and um, it was just determined that the inside of it is is just so debilitated it's just it's just not worth saving Troy um, it's, yeah, I, it's really I, I was on that committee Sandra mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we we know that the inside of the building is not worth saving but the facade of the building is in perfect condition and to tear the whole building down, it's like, you know, um, t tearing down a, a landmark that's been in the community I'm, since 1901. You know, I'm with you. you could do I'm, something to save the facade. I've seen buildings, I believe there's one on 12th street. It was in church. Uh, I believe uh -huh. it belongs to NYU now where they saved the front facade and they built behind it, you know, which is beautiful now. Um, the same should be considered for the Baruch bathhouse, you know. I, I thought the facade wasn't stable enough. No, the, um, the, the facade is stable. The facade is. The inside. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we, we've seen plenty of beautiful uh, situations where the exterior is restored and the interior is repurposed to serve a modern requirement. And it right. Works. Yes. So, we'll have it on. We'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Other ideas? 
Uh, Linda, together with the um, 22 East Broadway Whiting House, yes. there was another a small federal house also removed from that back log list. Is that the one on Oliver Street? Yeah. Yeah, I think the owners were so opposed. So it's owned by the church next door. Right. Um, I think it's, it's probably, we can put it back on, but they probably won't look at it. It's definitely eligible, but they won't, because of the opposition of the owners, they probably, and the owners being the church. They would, like you want, would you want to add would, the uh, Henry would, Street Firehouse? Uh, I think it would be great to add the Henry Street Firehouse. Um, I don't want to, you know, premature with that since we haven't kind of written the RFP yet. But I, I think we could put it on. It's a great, great addition to the list. I'll get the address of it later. It's uh, two sixty nine. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> My typing is not too great. And yeah, two sixty nine, Henry. Mm -hmm. See, um, I guess it's. Historic name is um, Engine Company 55. Okay, I'll make this right when I clean this up, but that's enough. Um, I like this idea of making changes on the fly like this where everybody can see them. Um, on the other hand, I should be a better typist. Uh, yeah, any other nominations for this list? Okay. Finally, we're talking about demolition by neglect. Oh, uh, Linda, I'm sorry to jump in. Uh, as oh, Richard. yes. Uh, do we have the, uh, maybe I missed it, but are the two buildings in there that were previously um, calendared by the commission and then thrown off the calendar by Menakshi uh, Srinivasan? Yes. Okay. Yes, those, I, are, the, I those are the ones that uh, Mitchell was talking about. Oh, yeah, I see now. Yeah. Sorry. The other is one Oliver Street. We, if we want to be mischievous, we can put it back on. Um, you know, sure. It's, uh, it's worth yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. The heck with uh, it. Someone, uh, someone uh, sent in that it's number two Oliver Street. Oh, maybe it is two. I thought it was one, but if it, if it was two, that's fine. I can always verify this. I won't, I won't let a mistake go through. Okay, got it. All right. So now, we the last thing we talked about was uh, the way the Landmarks Commission is dealing with demolition by neglect. Um, oh, yes. We lost the um, Beth Hamadrash Haggadah Synagogue. I would call that a demolition by neglect, even though the fire was started by kids that broke in there. I, I believe, and I look to Carolyn to update this, this statement, that kids have been breaking into this, into Charis as well. And that is yes. very it's Not only that, uh, May 29th, um, June 9th and 10th or 11th, there's been three different episodes that have been photographed of people on the roof uh, with a pickaxe. Oh my uh, God on the 29th, breaking up bricks, which we assume were going to be used in the protest. Um, on the 9th, there were about nine children that looked to be approximately between 13 to 16 years old who exited the building. We saw them coming out the door. They climbed over the edge of the building, over the scaffolding, and bolted down the street. The building windows are being broken, uh, even more so than they already were. It's being totally graffitied all over. And then on last Saturday, there were five people on the roof again, um, creating protest banners uh, with very uh, unpleasant words, uh, graphic words. Mm -hmm. uh, and they How were are like, they getting in there, Carolyn? Oh. The door's not locked. All they do is they climb over the fence and get in <laughs> and walk right in. Father Pat found six of them or seven of them sitting on his stoop talking about 
getting onto the third floor and the pigeons. You know, it's just, it, it, they had absolutely no problem uh, when the kids all trooped out of the building. But the and fact that they would get- Have you reported this at all? Uh, I just filed a complaint with 311 today. The people who observed them on the 29th and on the 10th uh, or 11th also reported it to the police. Okay. And I sent images to Detective Hernandez of the kids pouring out of the building and hopping over the scaffolding. And, and how about LPC? Have they been made aware? I'm fixed in the process of drafting a letter to LPC with the images. And it seems like them, they need to seal up that building. The building needs to be secured because right yes. now it's a risk. That the other thing, there's a vacate order on the building. It would be awful if something happened to those kids when they were in there. You know, because the fire department's not going to be able to go into the building. Right, right. It would also impact on housing on 8th Street, 9th Street, and 10th Street. And then those kids are just at that firebug age. Right. But it's also scary too. To mischief. Yeah. Right. But when you have the people that were on the roof are older. They're right. like the 18 to 20 some odd. But when yeah, somebody is taking things. a pickaxe and demolishing structures on the roof. I can't believe it. Yeah. He's got a great shot of it with the pickaxe. Well, it does sound like a uh, discussion with when with LPC and DOB is in order again, because the building needs to be secured so that the people can't get in there. It's a hope. Otherwise it is it, going, it is being demolished by neglect. Yeah, totally. But it's yeah. also a public hazard, you know, yes. for the people that live the adjacent whole neighborhood. to the building, to the whole neighborhood. I beg your pardon, um, if I may, um, this is brought to our attention as well. And we reported it to DOB, and I talked to John Weiss uh, at LPC. He said that he is going to I, and explain that the building is not sealed. And so on top of the very primary concern of da danger to people, there's also further damage to this building. Uh, he w told me this morning that he would follow up both with DOB and with the owner about this. Um, so uh, I think everybody's sending stuff in to DOB, to the police, to our politicians, to uh, LPC is all great, uh, but definitely we've, we've reached out as well. We're very concerned about this. Okay, yeah, I think so. get to our electeds and get to, uh, you know, the usual crowd. Right. Okay, and the other thing- Maybe they'll do something. Uh, Carrie, if Carrie, if you're still with us, um, Carrie, Hain had nominated the Mooney House at 18 Bowery. Uh, this is very alarming to me that such an important landmark is, is in a bad state. And I don't know, Mitchell, you may have something to say about it too, since you live in that area. Yeah, I, I know the owner has been working on the interior, but he seems to be neglecting the exterior. And uh, what's deteriorating is that um, Georgian um, entrance around uh, the bottom of the uh, columns are um, very deteriorated. Let me uh, just um, quickly grasp start. that sentence, okay. Georgian entry surround columns are deteriorating. Okay, what else? Well, that's that's one of the major um, issues. Okay. I don't know what else Carrie may have noticed. I don't know either. I don't know if she's still with us. I, I can't see everybody right now. But if you're around, Carrie, speak up. I think she might have gone. Um, anyway, that can certainly be, they can investigate that just as well as we can. Okay, and anybody else have any examples of demolition by neglect in our community district? Nope. Okay. Um, since one of our major landmarks already got demolished by neglect. Um, given the onerous deadlines between calendaring and designation opposed upon LPC, CB3 requests that LPC be given 
an increased budget and additional staff in order to handle both the proposed designations described above and the regulatory workload, which increases as each new landmark or historic district is designated. That's the statement. Now we'll be taking this up again next month, so there's room for continued thought about these matters. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Okay, moving right along. We're almost done. I just wanted to say a couple of words about the Beth Hamadrash Hagadol, um, which is, has been completely demolished now. It's an empty lot. Um, the Landmarks Commission has it on its agenda, for, I believe June 23rd. Um, it's the first item on the agenda. So uh, as you know, the Landmarks Commission hearings are, um, are by Zoom now. And, and they ask, they, all this information is on the LPC website, how to join in on the meetings. They ask that you join by going to YouTube unless you wanna speak because a large number of people do go to those meetings. Um, I don't know whether this is gonna be interesting or painful or what, but they will I'm surely vote to rescind the designation. There's nothing left to regulate. Right. Did someone else want to speak? I just came off. You need to mute yourself. I'll mute you. Okay, that, that was just so, by the way. Um, so we are now at the point where we need a motion to adjourn. I move I a motion. adjourn. I'll second. I second, yeah. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you Linda. For participating. Yes, thank you for all of you for coming. This is great.